Great. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Thompson. I'm the head of research here at uh, Small Cap Power and Ubica Research. And I'm uh, uh, pleased to uh, have David Skrilloff here today, who is the CEO of uh, uh, Specialty Liquid Transport, or SLT, present to us about his company. Uh, they are currently uh, working towards a, a merger where there will be a listing in Q3 of this year and concurrently trying to raise, uh, or not trying to raise, raising $5 million uh, at 40 cents a share uh, to help uh, fund their expansion. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, David. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I'm going to just thanks everybody for coming. Thanks everybody on the web for coming. Um, I'm going to just introduce Specialty Liquid Transport a little bit about the financing that we're doing, the proceeds for it, um, and then open it up to questions. Uh. So first, you know, the lawyers are telling me I got to put all the disclaimer language up, which everybody's seen and read, and I'm just going to go pretty quickly through that. Um, company highlights, and what we'll be talking about is our products, which is a proprietary patented, and some of it is patent pending technology. Um, for shipping of bulk liquids, and we'll talk about why and why it's, the, as far as I'm concerned, the, the most inexpensive way and probably even the greenest way to be shipping um, liquids. Um, sort of what, what makes us a leader in the marketplace, um, some of the barriers to entry in terms of certifications and the like. Um, you're going to hear about some of our very large customers, all names that everybody knows. Um, and some of the growth opportunities that we have in front of us. Um, so what do we do? We make a product called the Flexi Tank. Um, it's, we're not alone. It's an industry term for f what a Flexi Tank is, but it's a giant bag is how to think about it for shipping bulk amounts of liquid. Um, you can see a picture of it on the bottom. Um, we have two, two different products, one we call the Big Red Flexi Tank and our newest product, which is the proprietary product called the Liquid Ride. Um, but essentially, give you an idea, a Flexi Tank can hold, generally we're shipping between 20,000 and 25,000 liters of liquid at a time. It's all non-hazardous, so hazardous liquids can't go in one of these. Um, but give you an idea of some of the things that we ship and some of the people that, you know, of why it's used. Um, I think one of the best examples is our largest customer, which is Kumo Tire. Kumo is now the third largest tire manufacturer in the world. And if you think about tires, shipping tires is a real pain in the butt. Um, they're bulky, they're mostly air, they don't stack so well. Um, and so what Kumo has decided, and I believe all the other major tire manufacturers have decided as well, it's much more inexpensive to, um, to, to ship the liquid latex around the world and have smaller manufacturing facilities in all the various countries. So what we're doing is we're taking huge amounts of the liquid latex that they're making, all of that's made in Korea, and ship to all their facilities around the world where they make the tires and send it locally so you don't have the large issues of trying to send fully made tires everywhere. Um, another example, one of the big uses for this is we do a lot of, lot of shipping of juice. So Coca-Cola is one of our larger clients, um, growing very, very quickly. Um, so we're, for Coca-Cola, we're, we're, they're shipping in our products, both lemon juice and orange juice. And I guess we just did a big load of cranberry juice from Quebec down to their bottling facility in Florida. Again, the thought of trying to ship whole cranberries or whole lemons or it's a bulky product, it's hard to ship, they spoil. So, you know, what, what Coke and all the other juice manufacturers do is the juice is made at, is turned into from the fruit to the juice at the orchards um, and then, or the bogs in the cranberry case, and, um, and then shipped as bulk juice. So, um, that's, you know, that's what we do. It's a really pretty simple concept. You stick it in a big old bag and you ship the bag out. Um, so this is, this is, again, a couple of pictures, examples. The one on the, on, on, on the right here is, this is what we call the big red flexi tank. You can see it here in a, stuck in a 20-foot shipping container. It fills almost the entire container. The one on the left is our liquid ride product. That's in a refrigerated container. Um, one of the big advantages that we'll get into is, um, is 
the liquid ride is really the only one that works at the moment in refrigerated containers. So that's, that's what Coke would be using for their lemon juice. You got to keep it refrigerated or the stuff spoils. Um, but in general, what is a, so why a flexi tank over any other modalities? Um, here's the problem that you have. Um, in historically, what people have sent um, liquids in are these three methods, either what's called an isotank, that isotank is basically the same as a tanker truck, but with, for, for a ship. So they put a, a frame around it so it doesn't roll and they can load it in and off a ship. An IBC or an intermediary bulk container, which is the one in the middle, it's essentially five barrels all built into one. And the, the main place is oil drums. 55 gallon oil drums is what most liquids are sent in, historically continue to be. The problem with all of these are twofold. Um, and what really we solve, and it's sort of a little counterintuitive. A flexi tank is a single use product. You use it once, you fill it, you send it, you empty it, and then you throw it in the recycling bin and some recycler comes and turns it back into little plastic pellets. Um, all of these are multi-use products and you would usually think multi-use products are more, more both um, more economical and more environmentally friendly, but it turns out it's not the case because you got two main issues with a, um, a multi-use product. One is the clean out cost. You got it, once you ship this thing, you got to get it all cleaned out and it's expensive. Um, what, what we're finding, for instance, in California, which is the most expensive area to, be sh to, to, to clean stuff out, California is charging $1,500 to $2,000 US to clean out a tanker truck. Um, the, you, you get dirty water, it's got to be treated as if it's you know, um, contaminated water. It's a real problem. And then the second issue is, is you got to send it back to where it came. So if we're shipping cranberry juice from Quebec to Florida, you got to then get it back up to Quebec to go send more cranberry juice on to, to Florida again. And so you're shipping these things empty and that, that cost is also expensive. So the amount of water you're using, the amount of gas you're using to do the, both the clean out and the shipping, a single use product is actually both substantially economically cheaper and greener. Um, we'll talk a little bit later, but one of our partners is Maersk. Maersk did a study and they found that the savings for using a, um, a flexi tank as opposed to using drums is between $3,500 and $4,000 US um, per shipment. So when you're sending thousands of these or even millions of these in the case of a Coca-Cola or the like, um, it, it becomes quite significant, the savings. Um, again, so we've got, as I said, we've got our solution We've got the um, big red flexi tank, which is now the one on the left. And the one on the right pictured here are the liquid rides. Big red is our product that we've started the company with. It started in 2009. Um, it is a competitive product. So there are other people out there in the market who have a flexi tank. Um, all the historical products, including our Big Red, only work inside a 20-foot shipping container. So you stick it in. If you'll see, there's like a bumpering system at the doors to protect the doors because these things, when if you, you, you know, the, the, the truck stops short, you're going to have, you know, you got 25,000 liters of liquid in there. It's a lot of force. It, if you didn't have that bumper, it would just break the doors wide open. Um, and it, that the, the flexi tank uses the side walls of the container to give it its support. So think of it as a above ground swimming pool. You got the liner that holds all the liquid in, but then you also need the, 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 the frame to support the liquid and hold it in place. That's historically how it's been. Our flexi tank is really considered the Mercedes or the Cadillac of the space. It is, um, it, it has the, the fewest number of sort of issues in terms of leakage or a breakage or anything else. I mean, I don't think we've seen a leak in over two years now. Um, I should say we've seen some leaks that aren't the fault. For instance, we got a call a couple of weeks. Uh, no, I guess it was now probably six months ago. Port in Long Beach called. They said one of our bags broke. You get there, there's two giant holes where they put the forklift right through the side of the container. You know, I don't know too many things to <laughs> survive that. I don't consider that our issue. And ultimately, the port didn't either. Um, 
But it's really, you know, we spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of proprietary um, manufacturing techniques to make sure it really is the highest quality of the products. We have a $10 million um, insurance per leak from Lloyd's of London in case there is ever an issue. Um, and it really is, it's probably the most expensive of the flexi tanks out there, but it's also considered the best. And I think it's why, you know, when we get to our customer base, you'll see all the larger customers are choosing to use our product because the last thing they want to do is wake up one morning and hear that there's been a leak of their product in some river or lake or whatever else might be. Um, hey, can I ask just a quick question? Shoot. Uh, in terms of temperature control, is it in the bags or is it in the actual transport? So I'll get there in a second, but it's in the actual transport. So there is no temperature control within the bags. The problem with, with the Big Red and with the other flexi tanks is twofold. One, they really don't make um, refrigerated containers in 20-foot containers. Um, and secondly, as you see, it uses up about 80% of the, of the volume of the container is filled with the flexi tank and, and the liquid. So even if you did have a cooling system, you just can't get it, the, the amount of liquid versus air you're ultimately cooling, that thermodynamics won't work. You can't keep anything cold. Um, if you see here in, in a truck, you know, there's substantially more surface area where the, the whole air gets cool in a, and you'll see, I think actually, let's go to, I think I'm going the wrong way. Here you'll see, this is, this is actually a Maersk refrigerated container. And you'll see within the refrigerated containers, they have vents going all through the floor here. Um, they're also going up the wall, so the air is really circulating around everything and keeping everything really cold. So it, it, you really need to, you know, to get the right temperature control, you need in a special refrigerated container, and you, they're just not there for so the 20s. This visual leads me to another question. I don't see the bumper system here protecting the So let me drop it back. So. When we talk about the big red flexi tank, that has the bumpering system. It, it's part of the support system, right? As I said, it's the walls are being used for support. You can't use the door for support. So that's why the bumpering system is in there. Um, the newer product, which is the Liquoride, does not have a bumpering. It is really the first of the freestanding products. So this is a flexi tank. It does not need to use the walls for the support. It uses it a little bit, but it's not putting a lot of weight on it. Um, and, and therefore, what, what this does and why we're seeing such growth and why we're so excited about the opportunities is because of the Liquoride. Because what it's doing is it's opening up all kinds of other shipping modalities. So historically, you're stuck with a 20-foot shipping container. They've become one non-standard. They're hard to find. They certainly don't come in refrigerated containers. Um, and so now, by having something that's freestanding, we can put it just in the back of a semi-truck like this. Um, we can put it in a 40 foot or 53 foot container um, and you can put it um, in a refrigerated container. And the other part of a refrigerated container, because there's so much um, ventilation system going through the walls, there's much less steel. So you could, if you had to rely on the, the side walls to give it its support, you'd bow out the side walls with that much liquid. So um, it, it and, and so this is the product that is really where we're seeing the tremendous amount of growth, the real substitution, because now you've, you've got, you can just stick it over the road, right? You can put it in the back of a refrigerated semi-tractor trailer and Speaking go. Speaking that, how constrained are you? Are there plenty of uh, refrigerated containers and refrigerated transportation? There is. Um, and so again, this is about, a lot of this is about the substitution effect. So if you're putting it in here, right, what you're, what you're replacing is that, right, a tanker truck. Um, so if you look at the economics of that, there's, oops, I'm sorry, I think I clicked the wrong way. So if you look at the economics of going between a regular semi and a tractor and a tanker truck, Tanker trucks are one, they're more expensive. It's a much more expensive purchase of a truck, so you got much more depreciation. Um, it's more expensive, therefore it's more expensive per mile to operate. Um, they actually have a shorter useful life. The tractor, the drivers for a tanker truck need extra license 
certifications. So again, it's more expensive for a driver. And the final part is it's much harder to find the return trip, right? So if you're a trucker, the key is you better have their return trip, if, particularly if you're going long distances. So if you're running something in a long distance, if you don't have that return trip, it's costing you a fortune to run it back. Um, to find a tanker truck, you, got, you deliver it, you gotta then find the cleaning station, clean it out, find another liquid to go in. If you're running a semi, once you get it to, the, to wherever it's going, to find the load to come back, even if it's not liquid, is a much, much easier product. So one of our joint venture partners we'll talk about later is a group called Vetters. Vetters is the, I believe now, they're the largest liquid, on-road liquid shipper for Western Canada. And, um, and because of what they do, a lot of the loads have returns, and that's great. But some of the others have real issues. So for instance, if they're shipping up, historically they were shipping um, drilling fluids up to sort of some of the rigs up in, you know, above the Arctic Circle. When it gets there in a tanker truck, there's nothing to bring back. There's no return, and it's costing them a fortune. So they've now started using our product with, um, in, a, in a semi, in a regular tractor trailer, you bring it up there, there's always parts, there's always something that you can bring back. So that's sort of some of the ideas of, you know, what some of these trucking companies and guys are looking at and why there's this big substitution effect here with a liquor ride. Um, this is, as I said, here's a case study. Um, Maersk is one of our partners. We actually did a private label product for Maersk that they call Liquicool. Instead of our red and black, it's blue and blue. Um, I will tell you the hardest thing that we had to do with Maersk was getting the color right. I think we went through 12 iterations of those colors to make sure it matched the Maersk colors. But um, Maersk is a great example. So Maersk has got a, you know, this is, this is one of their refrigerated containers. And it's actually, it's a really sophisticated unit. As you saw, there's all these ventilations through it, the refrigeration system. You can track the temperature on a real-time basis anywhere in the world. If you wanted to raise it two degrees now and drop it in a couple hours, you can go do all of that, all connected actually through a Maersk IBM blockchain that they did. Um, you know, everybody wants to talk how we're blockchain related here. <laughs> um, so um, Maersk though is, you know, they have a 110 person um, sales force only selling their refrigerated containers. And they wanted to figure out how do they get a differentiation, right? The shipping's pretty commodity, even refrigerated containers are pretty much of a commodity. Um, they felt that this would give them a differentiation in terms of shipping of liquids in their refrigerated systems. Um, we did a very large deal with them. We're in the process of um, training a number of the sales force. We've run a number of trials. Um, mostly where they've been, been focusing is on the concentrated juice market to start with. Um, most of that is from South America, mostly out of Brazil, and shipping all over the world. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, in the Maersk study, when Maersk looked at these costs, they found, you know, the average cost savings is around $2,500 to $3,000. So it's really, you know, it's a substantial cost savings. It also, besides just the, the actual cost savings, it's also a very large manpower savings. So it's a much quicker, you know, if you think about it, an average container has 125 drums on the, on the container. So if you got to fill each drum, put the cover on it, put on a pallet, load it onto a container, and then at the other side empty it, pull the things off, put a hose in and pump out each 125 drums, here we've got three bags. So it's a substantially um, manpower savings as well as just the regular cost savings. So you fill it up on the truck? You fill these on the truck. So you, you roll it out, we, we send the empty bags to wherever they need to be, it gets rolled out and installed on the, in, the, in the truck or in the container, and it gets emptied in the truck or in the container. Once it has liquid in it, you're not moving it. I mean, it's, you know, so a liter of water is a, is a kilogram of water, right? So, you know, you're looking at 25,000 kilograms on here. Um, you're not gonna move it. So I, I, uh So messy and hard to like is that 
how does that work with rolling it out in the truck and then and then when you're done with the so we pack it in a way that it, it's really easy to roll, okay. right? It's folded in a very specific way. You, each bag weighs about 40 to 60 pounds, depending on the size of the bag. Um, you put it in 40 to 60 pounds empty. So you put it in, you roll it out. We have a real training program where we go train everybody on how to, how to do the installation. We actually give these guys the certificate they're very, it's, it's amazing little things like a certificate, how proud, you know, some guy in Brazil who has no high school education even, and you give him a certificate as an expert installer, how proud they are of it, right? Um, and, but, you know, you got to be careful because, you know, it's more about making sure the container's clean, there's no glass, there's no nail sticking out of the floors, you know, people will pound the nail into to secure a pallet and then not pull it out. So, you know, it's, it's really about just making sure everything's clean and there's no nails, no glass, no e any other issues, and then how to install it all properly. How long does it take to install? Um, you can get a container installed in about 10 to 15 minutes. And to so, once it arrives on site, you empty it on site. So, it depends on what's in it to how long it's going to take to empty. Usually, the emptying is under an hour. Some things like orange juice concentrate that are so thick and viscous it just won't pump that quick. To empty, once, once it's empty, you just sort of pull the entire bag right out of the container and throw it in a recycling garbage bin. Um, it weighs a little bit more because there is some residual product in there. Um, we found that you know, our product, we, there's, for whatever reason, there's, there's usually substantially less residual than a number of other guys who are trying to do similar products. Um, there's a couple of guys who sort of, for instance, put some baffling systems in and all and leave hundreds of liters of residual product behind and it becomes impossible to move. We're generally leaving somewhere around 25 to 40 liters of residual, so it makes a 40 pound bag, a 100 pound bag, two guys can certainly drag it out of a container and throw it out. They wouldn't, they wouldn't cut it up up or down, No, they, they don't cut it up. There, there is one exception to cutting it up, which we'll get into when we talk about some of the product growths. Um, it's just a strange. Do you get any negative feedback from the recycling companies dealing with this? No, I mean, it depends on, on where it is. I will tell you, one of Maersk's biggest concerns was how do we guarantee it gets recycled? You know, Copenhagen-based company. I mean, I've never seen anybody place more green than Copenhagen. I mean, there's, there's, you go to downtown Copenhagen, there's a garage that holds two million bikes and every day it's filled. You know, I met the CEO of, of Maersk and he biked into work. It was like, really? Okay. But so one of their big giant concerns was how do you recycle or guarantee? Places like Canada, places like the United States, there's enough recyclers, it usually works. We can find guys who want to take this and recycle it. Sometimes they'll pay them, sometimes they'll take it for free. Um, places like the Far East, I think it's a little bit more difficult. I think they're just tossing it in a garbage can and not worrying about it. So, um, But we, we encourage recycling, we try to get them to do it. I don't think we're always successful. Do you have localized manufacturing for, for these bags? All of our bags are manufactured in a facility in Michigan. So we have one facility in Michigan that makes them. Um, you'll see part of the proceeds for this offering is we're in the process of putting in a second production line, which will allow us to double capacity. Um, and it's, that's contracted out? It's an outsourced manufacturing facility. So it's all our equipment, it's all our IP, it's all of our, you know, we provide all of the materials, everything else. We just have a contract labor force running it. Um, so in terms of the size, the, 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 the global flexi tank market is somewhere around a billion or a billion and a half dollars, growing very, very quickly. But when, when you looked at these research studies, it, it really looked at sort of the flexi tank market, right? The, the big red, the historical market of what can you put in a 20 foot container? Um, I think with the ability of liquoride and the ability to do things in trucks 
in refrigerated containers, I think this instantly <coughs> at least doubles of market size, if not even more. It's, it's really opened up the modalities. I would tell you, for instance, if we didn't have something for a Coca-Cola where that could go in a refrigerated truck or a refrigerated shipping container, we wouldn't have that business. That's, that's what we're doing. That's what they're excited about. Um, so here's some of the growth opportunities and sort of what we're seeing right now and one of the reasons why we're, we're working to double the capacity because we've got the demand now that we need to get capacity doubled and why when we get to some of the projections that we're going to give all the forward-looking statement stuff, um, why I'm really confident on it. Coke we talked about. Coke really, we just started last year doing business with Coke. I think we have now over half of their lemon juice market around the world is going on our, on our products. As I said, we just started last month, we just did our first shipment of cranberry juice and we're starting to move a bunch of orange juice for them as well. Um, all of the lemon juice and the orange juice is for a product that they have called Simply Lemonade and Simply Orange, which is their highest end lemonade and orange juice, not from concentrate, fresh juices. Um, they're scouring, right now, it's amazing, they can't find enough lemon juice. They're scouring the world looking for lemon juice on how quick this is growing. And, you know, and I also think partially the hurricanes from last year hurt them because it killed all the lemon crops in Florida. Um, Binyamin is a really hot topic up here. Every time I've been in Canada lately, it's all I seem to hear about on the news. Um, so Binyamin is really, I mean, it's the, the, the end residual product out of the whole petroleum processing, it's, it's asphalt or, or, or road surface. So really a road is bitumen plus an aggregate makes road. Um, the, the, and in Canada, right, the issue is, is you got in the tar sands up in um, Alberta, you, you're getting tremendous amounts of bitumen at the end of the whole process. The United States has decided to shut down the pipeline for the historical way, get rid of the bitumen and send it down to the United States. Um, they've shut down that pipeline. This is even before Trump has decided to add all these extra tariffs and other shit he's doing. Um, but, you know, the U.S. basically said, with all the fracking, we've got enough bitumen on our own. We're shutting it down. When I was in, I guess, Vancouver the other day, all I was hearing on the news was about the pipeline and the fights of the pipeline to get a pipeline from Vancouver to, or from, to Vancouver from Calgary to, for shipping the bitumen. So what do you do with it? Um, we've now got two, two customers who are taking that bitumen, putting it in our flexi tanks and sending it first on the rails to, to, to the coast and then over to China and India. Um, somebody asked me about pumping out the bags or do you ever cut the bags was the question. This is the one area where I see actually they cut the bags. So when it gets to China, the bitumen is pretty set up, it's pretty hard. They just pull it over a big giant open pit of hot molten bitumen. They tip the truck up, they, they slice the bag and it just pours, falls into the pit and off they go. So it's the one area where they don't even <laughs> pump it out but um, it's, it's a product that this bitumen's a great example because it's really, we're the only ones who could, they could have done this with. If you're trying to do this using barrels, it's just too expensive. Um, there's, there's a very tight margin on this product. Um, you gotta do it as cheap as possible. But secondly, they're pumping it in at about, it says here 82 degrees Celsius. I was gonna say 165 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is very hot. Our flexi tank is the only one that can withstand this kind of heat. We work very closely with our plastic manufacturers to add, do all kinds of additives to make sure that it could withstand the heat without melting. Um, it can, it does. We've run a number of, we've run, we're now starting to run this. We've run, I would say, about 50 different trials. It goes into full production mode starting July is the first full production system we're sending. I think we're sending 300 bags in July. It was a big logistics thing. One, you had to make sure the bags didn't melt. Two, you're sending 300 bags, so it's 300 train cars over the course of one month. It took a lot of effort with both the CP and the CN to get that logistically right. Do you have to maintain the heat? No, the heat cools. That's why at the end, their end in China, it's hard that bitumen is really sort of set and that's why they just cut the bag and dump it. Um, 
but you, have, you can't pump it in unless it's hot. If it's, if it's not at that temperature, it just won't pump. Um, and so we're, um, you know, it was a big work with both the CP and the CN to get the trains. Um, we are also one of only two flexi tank guys who the CP or the CN will let on their trains. Um, we've gone through a huge amount of tests with them. It's similar in the United States um, where you, they, they, you bring it, they take a test, they, they lift a, con they fill a container with it, they lift it up to um, 10 feet high and they drop it and make sure it doesn't bust. They then ram it into a bumper at 15 miles an hour and also make sure it doesn't bust. Um, it, it really, it, it's quite impressive when you watch one of these things get bumped at that speed and the amount of liquid just flowing everywhere and think that it doesn't bust. It's really, it's really there's a lot of engineering behind it. Um, I will tell you also, as we're talking about testing, with Maersk, why did, the reason we got this deal is about two years ago, Maersk put out an RFP asking for a flexi tank that would work um, in their refrigerated containers. And we showed up with ours, with our liquid rides. 16 other customer companies showed up with a flexi tank type product. <coughs> Maersk did their tests. All of the other 16 had catastrophic blowouts. So at the end of the day, they filled it up with 24,000 liters of liquid, and there was 24,000 liters of liquid on the test track. We didn't lose one drop. Um, and that's why we were able to get this deal with Maersk. And why I can say, certainly two years ago, we were the only ones who could handle such a, a you know, work in a refrigerated container or any of these sorts of non 20 foot modalities. Um, I think people are trying, but you know, we've got a big advantage and there's also some barriers to entry like these tests that the rails do, the highway authorities do and everything else, which is expensive and takes a long time to get there. Um, so where are you scale to your competition? Where are, where, there's two competitors who are substantially larger than us. Um, one's a Chinese group. Um, I would say does probably, $300 million a year in sales. Um, most of their business is just short haul throughout Asia, mostly within China. It's an area we, we do zero business in. Um, the other is a group called Hill and Brand. Hill and Brand probably does about $150 million a year in sales. They own the liquor industry. So Hill and Brand really moves almost all liquor. So they do a, they are the largest mover of kegs in the world, right? So if you think of kegs, it's a logistical issue. I got, got the keg, I got to get it at the brewery, I got to get it to a bar, and then I got to get it back to the brewery when it's empty. Um, so they do that. They do within their flexi tank group, it's mostly wine. So they dominate the wine industry within the flexi tank business. I would, I believe, um, I've read several places, wine is probably the biggest user of flexi tanks in the world. Not, not with us, but in the world in general, flexi tanks with wine, mostly the really cheap stuff going out of places like Argentina and, you know, and Colombia and the like over to China and Russia, um, where it's then bottled. Um, in terms of our business model, um, why, why I think, you know, one, it's a very simple product, simple to understand, um, but what's so nice is it's a razor blade, right? You, it's a single use product, once you get a customer, it's a really, really sticky customer. They're not changing back. They're, they're using yours. They're happy. Um, it's a long sales cycle initially, but once you get them, you get them for life. So you're selling them a razor blade every day, every week, every month um, for their shipping. It's not changing, um, which, you know, is a great model. Liquor right. What is the cost? So it depends. It, we, you know, it depends one on the customer and some of the other stuff. But in general, a flexi tank is somewhere around 700 to $750. Um, a liquor ride, which if you saw in the picture, it's generally you got three liquor rides in, an, in a truck or in a 53 foot container. The three liquor rides together are selling for $1,000 or 1050 actually. Um, Talking about market size, you're saying um, flex tank one and a half billion by 2024. What is it written? 
probably about you know billion one billion two. They're saying it's growing about twenty, about ten to fifteen percent a year. But I also, as I said, that's a flexi tank of what can you stick? So non-hazardous liquids that are currently being shipped in twenty-foot containers. Um, and you know, I think this, you know, that's why I'm, you know, why I'm very excited. Why I'm here is because I think this liquid ride becomes a game changer because it's a completely new market that's never been included as a flexi tank market. So again, if you're saying right now it's about one point one, and you accounted for about four hundred and fifty between uh, the Asian uh, entity and, and Helen Brown, right? Uh, who's doing the balance of it? Is that all a bunch of small operators? There's a bunch of small operators. Um, and as I said, most of the business of this flexi tank business seems to be short haul within the Far East. So do you see this as um, a consolidation play or just uh, keep the crap out of the competitor? I don't see it as either. I see this as, I, I'm not going after the, these competitors of this business. I'm. I'm not even going after them. I think that the play is to switch from using a different, using a barrels or using a, an entire tanker to using this, which is not part of that flexi tank business. Nobody else is doing that. Nobody else can do it. It's getting, it's having a product that is so good and is not going to leak that someone like a Coke or like a Maersk or like a Dow Chemical doesn't hesitate go to use this product because they're still saving a lot of money. They're, they're being environmentally friendly, but they don't have to, there's still not the issue of what happens if it leaks because it doesn't. Um, so I'm not, I really don't look at myself as trying to compete with, with the other guys. I'm, you know, I'm really trying to, to, to go and take a business that, create a business that almost didn't exist for a flexi tank. And, and, and that's what we've been doing. I mean, that's where Coke is. Coke has never used a flexi tank before us. Um, it's, it's that, that's where the opportunity is. Um, because it's, it, there's a, I, you know, I have a video that, um, but we, that I, 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 this is not my computer, so it's not on here, but um, we, there's, for instance, the factory in Spain, which is a big distribution center, which is where all the, um, the, the juice coming in and out of Spain um, is sent, or, or one of two. And if you go there, it's about a 300 to 400,000 square foot facility. And I would say two thirds of it to the entire ceiling is filled with empty drums. It's cheaper to just go use a new drum than it is to try to clean it out and send it back. If you went there and said, I need a drum, they'd charge you a dollar and give them to you. Um, they don't know what to do with them. It's a pain in the butt. It's a logistical nightmare. It's hard to deal with. That's why, that's where the opportunity is, is to say, don't use a drum, use this. Or you're send, you got a tanker truck, don't use a tanker truck. Put this in the back of a semi. It's much cheaper to operate. You got, you know, if your vetters and your tanker trucks is, as they start depreciating out and you got to start replacing them, don't replace them with a new tanker truck. Let's replace them with a, with a standard semi and use liquorides. And so that, that's where the market expansion is. That's what we're seeing rather than trying to go after customers for their existing customer base. Um, as I said, it's a very sticky customer. If they're using, if they've gone to a flexi tank I'm, I'm not trying to steal them as well. The guys are not stealing my customers either because they're happy with what the service and what I'm providing to them. Um, it's really, I, it's interesting because the flexi tank industry all, all, all told is about 10, 11 years old right now is when sort of the first flexi tanks came out. Most people in, for, for, in the shipping world are just starting to think about changing over. They're not the, the early adapters. A 10 year cycle for, oh, well now we see that they work and in general it's a good idea, now let's start looking at it. So you're seeing a lot of guys starting to say, okay, maybe now it's been around 10 years, we can start looking at it. Um, and now you give them an alternative, a really good alternative to a lot of other modalities and that's really where this growth is. Um, what are your uh, elements of um, so most of the patents are just around the design. Um, 
is where we have some patents um, and some other patents pending. There's also a number of trade secrets that we have within the manufacturing facility. So for instance, we worked with a group. Um, there's on that bump ring system, there's some patents on that, on the design. Um, we actually used a bunch of car engineers out of Detroit to help us design that bump ring system. Um, we have in the factory, for instance, these helium testers where we're pumping every empty bag gets pumped in with this helium and it has these detectors that, de that detect minute amounts coming out into the, out of the bag to detect any leaks, right? Helium's a much smaller gas than air. If there's the tiniest hole within the plastic, we're gonna detect it. Um, we work very closely. This was a company that was actually doing this within the, um, in the medical group and medical world, and we worked very closely with them to design these product, this, these testers. They're proprietary to us. Um, nobody else, as far as we know, has anything close to that to figure out if there's leaks or any problems within a test. So we really do go through a lot to make sure that there's no issues. Um, Again, an idea of some of our customers, we talked about some of them, Maersk, Coca-Cola, Vetters. DHL is a very interesting customer as well, which sort of goes on the model of where we're growing. So the idea for us for growth is to, to partner up with customers who in general let them go out and sell the product as part of a combined solution. Exactly what Maersk is doing, right? Maersk is out there selling this as part of their refrigerated container group. DHL is doing something very similar. DHL, for instance, um, has, we, we just want to deal with DHL with actually where we're shipping with Dow, where DH, Dow put out a RFP for a global shipping pro, um, proposal from one of their divisions and it required air, sea, rail, liquid, solids, you know, all kinds of stuff. One of those proposals where there's probably four or five shipping companies in the world, DHL, FedEx, UPS, who could have responded. DHL is now including us as part of these RFPs for anyone that requires bulk liquid shipping of non-hazardous materials. Um, and so, um, you know, there's, there's right now, I believe there's about seven RFPs outstanding right now with, with DHL. The first big one we won is this one with Dow. But again, like Maersk, like, DH, like DHL, um, several, like Vetters, all we're doing is training their own, a couple of salespeople within the organization. When we sell, we just get a call from Maersk saying, please ship X number of bags to, to some place. And we ship them, we bill Maersk. Um, so I can grow my business based off of these customers without really any extra cost. So my, um, my gross profit on sales to mares basically go right to the bottom line, um, which is a wonderful, from my point of view. Um, and that's sort of, that's been the methodology of we're trying to grow is with partners like that, or obviously with someone like Coke, again, I have one person who's dedicated to serving Coke and that's it. Um, it's, it's, you know, most of that gross profit is going again down to the bottom line. Um, the board and the management, I'm the CEO, director. Um, most of my life I've been on your side of the table, um, both as an investment banker, as a portfolio manager. Um, I have been a CFO of a public company in the United States. I was initially an investor in here. Um, in 2015, we had an opportunity to sort of do a restructuring and myself and two other shareholders take control. And then in 2017, the board asked me to come and be the CEO. Um, Shane Sims is my COO. Thankfully, he's there. He's been with the company since its founding. Um, he knows more about flexi tanks and shipping than anybody I have ever met in my life. He really does run the operations, keeps everything running, knows, you know, everything from helping to design new products to um, installations to everything else that's going on. So he is, he's why I get to focus on things like raising money and growing the business and some acquisitions we're working on and the like um, and let him run. Brian is brand new. He, he, um, he's actually going to be our CFO concurrent with this um, merger into the CPC. Um, he's out of Vancouver. 
so far I'm thrilled to have him on board. Um, he came from the film and media industry um, as a CFO there. Film and media accounting is so much more, more complicated than what we do that I have no, no question he's going to be a wonderful um, addition to our team. Um, in terms of the board, Rana, very successful businessman up here and based out of British Columbia. Um, he actually is one of the members of the board of the CPC. We agreed to have one of them on the board with us going forward. So Ron is on our board. Ian Troop is here in Toronto. Um, very, very senior position at both Procter & Gamble and ConAgra. Um, head, you know, head of marketing. He ran the Pan Am Games here in Toronto. Um, Again, a very successful businessman, adding tremendous amounts of expertise to our board in terms of the marketing side. He's also bringing us to, to various very senior level guys at P&G and ConAgra where he believes they're gonna be able to get a lot of sales out of it. Um, Soki is one of our other directors. Soki is also with the Shell at the moment. Um, what uh, TSX said is they want a majority of Canadian directors, so Soki is with us at the moment. Um, again, investment banker most of his career. When we bring in some, we're working on trying to find the Canadian with shipping experience. When we do, Soki will step down. Um, and then Steve Lefkowitz is someone I've known for 30 years. Um, former investment banker Drexel Burnham um, has had his own investment group, venture capital, um, private equity group for years, um, sits on several boards, um, very successful financier. Um, I think Chris talked about this very briefly. You know, the, the deal we're working on is a um, $5 million offering. Um, 50, um, 40 cents a share, common stock, half a warrant, 24 month warrant at 55 cents. Proceeds, a million dollars of the proceeds is to finish the expansion of the plant that we've um, started. It'll add about $30 million of annual sales to the business with this facility um, or the capability of doing an extra 30 million in sales. Um, some of it, a piece of it is to just clean up the balance sheet, some, some payables and some short-term notes and just come out with a pristine balance sheet. Um, and then the rest is for working capital on all the materials and everything we need to grow the business. Um, <coughs> here's our numbers. Um, we did $17 million in sales last year. I'm projecting over the next 12 months that we're gonna do $35 million in sales. Um, I think it's, I, I think it's very achievable. Just if you go back a couple of pages, you'll see on the near-term opportunities that alone, those few opportunities alone, give us a vote for 35 million in sales. So, I think it's very, very doable. Um, gives us an operating income over the next 12 months of over four million dollars. Um, capitalization of the company post the merger. Um, we're doing, there's two, two sets of shares. There's a class A and a class B, where the class B is a restricted non-voting stock. Um, it's being done to make sure that this stays as a non-foreign issuer up in Canada, such because we have a number of, a majority of US shareholders, the US guys are gonna get a large piece of these class B shares where it's non-voting, non-tradable until more and more shares get out of the United States. Um, I'm told it's a pretty common structure here in Canada. Um, but at the end of the day, there's gonna be about 45 to 50, I guess here it says 60 million shares of Class A shares. Um, and um, you know, Blue Bay, which is the CPC, is keeping four million. The investors on a $5 million deal get 12 SLT for the, for the, the company and the technology. You'll have 45 million of these. Um, Class A shares. Um, the financing is an A, or all A. It's only the financing is only being offered up in Canada, such that we can make sure it stays all A and more and more. How long will it take you to get the second production line up and running and revenue full? So it's already we've already started that process. 
the long lead time products have all been ordered. The first, the most impressing of the product is now in-house and we're getting it set up. So I think we can have it up and running in full production by the end of the third quarter. Your 16 and 17 sales are virtually the same, but your gross profits have. So there's, there's two issues to, to one, an accounting treatment in 16 that affected it, and we'll go into it. There was just, you know, so, and the biggest effect was actually the hurricanes. So I had been projecting through the end of August last year that last year we'll do 21 million in sales. Um, and then we had these two hurricanes that basically shut down the Gulf Coast of, Flor of the United States. Um, and it was interesting because when they were going through, our main warehouse and office facility is out of Houston. And I'm thinking we're underwater. We got all kinds of problems. We, we, we came out scot-free. But what happened is, in terms of um, if you look at what primarily gets shipped in, a, in our bags, it's petroleum-based products and it's food-based products. All the petroleum products out of the United States are along the Gulf Coast. Texas, Louisiana, that whole area. And then all the fruit guys are all along, are in Florida. And every one of them were shut down for at least eight weeks as they all had to like clean out facilities and get up and running. I have one customer who just finally got up last week. So we, we lost probably, I would say on average, 10 to 12 weeks of revenues where the US was, was essentially shut down but we were still running the facility and the factory to make for everybody else and running it at about 25% capacity and killed our margins. So we just got killed that way. On, that was on the negative side in, in, in for 17. On 16, what happened is the first audit we ever got done was in 15. <coughs> and the auditors basically, because they had no starting count, made us start the, our inventory at zero. When we, um, when 16 came along and they found that, oh no, you have all this extra inventory because they did the physical count, we, we had to take a write up back in, um, in 16, which the, the contra entry was, a li was reducing cost of sales. So there was about a $2 million cost of sale reduction in 16 that shouldn't be there because of the accounting anomaly. Related question, are you uh, financials US GAAP or their U.S. gap, um, the translation for us between U.S. gap and IFRS, I'm told, is zero. The auditors are right now working through all that translation tables and everything else, but nobody foresees any translations whatsoever needed. Um, going forward, obviously, we're going to be under IFRS. We've not, nobody of substance. Have we lost small guys here and there? Sure we have, but really, I, no, you know what? We've lost one customer of substance that I know of, which is in the wine industry, um, where I would say we lost them, but we also didn't want them. The wine industry is very fickle in which Frequently, if they send bad, bad juice in the, in the container, at the other end, they blame you for it going bad. It was the bag, it was some other system, it let too much air in, whatever. And then you're always just fighting over that. And you know, my guess is 99.9% .9 of the time, it's not the bag or any other issues. It's just they put bad, bad juice in on the front end. And it was such a fight and such a pain in the butt. They said they're going elsewhere and we were happy to let them go. So, as I said, ours is the most expensive of the product. The, 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 the least expensive of the product, some of these Chinese bags that we see out there, I've seen out for about $350, $400 a bag, where we're sort of, I mean, we're at seven, call it. So, I mean, substantially cheaper until you have one that breaks. And then, then you got issues, right? Then it becomes substantially more expensive. Um, so I, 
I would say we've lost some, as I said, we've lost some smaller customers who are really, really price conscious. Uh, we've lost a couple of customers and where there's, you're moving real commodities. There's a couple of areas like glycerol that is such a commodity business that they've got to figure out how to save every penny everywhere and are willing to take a risk. So we have lost some to, 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 um, commo to other flexi tank guys based on price. As I said, most of them are real commodity businesses that you just, it, you know, it, you just can't. It's not the type of the customers I'm fighting over. It's the customer who really sees the advantage, right? And you know, as I said, it's we got a Mercedes or a Cadillac of the space. There are guys who are willing to pay more for a Mercedes, right? There's other guys who want a Hyundai, and shouldn't say anything bad about Hyundai. I mean, we we do a lot of business out of South Korea, uh -huh. <laughs> but um, you know, everybody has their different, you know, different types. You know, how good do you want? What kind of risk tolerance do you want? What kind of insurance do you want to make sure is behind it, right? I mean. We've heard horror stories about a Chinese manufacturer. You had a big leak, you know, because the problem is if this is in the hull of a ship and it leaks, they don't know what, what's leaking. And they got to treat it as hazardous. It, it might be piled, you know, 20 high on top of 20 other containers. We actually, there was just a leak. And so Kumo uses, um, there's two other guys that Kumo uses as well. One of them had a bust and we heard that, you know, liquid latex leaked all over his ship. It's not an easy cleanup. Um, it's very expensive. You got You better be very, very sure that that person behind who made that product is going to stick up to it. Is going to have the insurance there. Isn't going to just close up the, the business and open up under a new name two days later. Um, so you know there is a, um, there is, there is a reason why we charge a premium product, um, you know, charge a premium price, because we think we have a premium product that is gonna far exceed anybody's expectations. Have you ever had an insurance claim? We have. Um, I would say we have not had an insurance claim in four years. Um, but every so often, you know, and, and I think, you know, you learn from those, right? I mean, when we, you know, over the years, you figure out how to make a better bag and a stronger bag and what to do. Um, the insurance claim, we actually had a bad roll of plastic that we didn't know that came from our manufacturer and, you know, had a couple of leaks and breaks and you learn from it and you work with the manufacturer and you learn how to test the product and make sure that you don't get that bad roll again or if it comes, you've detected it this time. Thank you. Thank David for his time today. If you have any more questions, uh, give us contact information. And uh, thank you all for attendance today.